So, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to another uh, ESC Spotlight on Science uh, webinar. Uh, Manuel and I, we are very delighted to welcome you again. Today, we are dealing with a really hot uh, topic, uh, both from a clinical and uh, basic point of view. Uh, the topic of uh, this uh, spotlight is metabolic dysfunction associated uh, steato steatotic liver disease. This is a condition that uh, changes names. Uh, uh, we had the change very recently, but um, names uh, do not matter, uh, in my opinion, and uh, um, in the opinion of many clinicians and researchers. The problem is here. Uh, many patients have uh, this uh, problem, especially many patients with type 2 diabetes uh, mellitus and obesity. And uh, this uh, clinical condition is something that uh, uh, we are going to deal during everyday clinical practice uh, more and more. Uh, today we have uh, two excellent uh, speakers, um, uh, Dr. Sokolov Sokolovska from Latvia and uh, Dr. Nogueiras from Spain. Um, uh, the first speaker will uh, cover the clinical aspects of this clinical condition, uh, while during uh, the second lecture we will see some more uh, basic and uh, biochemical uh, details. We will start with Dr. Sokolovska, and please allow me to introduce her. Uh, maybe, Manuel, you want to say hi before I introduce uh, Sokolo uh, Zelizaveta? Absolutely. So thank you, uh, Lina, for the presentation. It, it is a great pleasure also for me to to host this spotlight on science with you. So welcome everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will have a really interesting session today. Thank you. So uh, Elizaveta Sokolovska completed her MD studies in 2006 and obtained a PhD uh, degree in 2014 at the University of Latvia. She's a certified, uh, certified uh, internist and endocrinologist. Postdoctoral research was carried out at the University of Latvia in collaboration with uh, uh, Folkanghans Research Center in Helsinki, Finland, and uh, focused on mechanisms of complications in type 2 diabetes in humans. Since 2017, she's leading the laboratory for personalized medicine at the University of Latvia. The group mainly focuses on mechanisms involved in the development of um, uh, complications of diabetes. Recently, the main attention of uh, her research was paid to associations of uh, endotoxinemia, nutritional factors, and glucose var variability um, in type 1 diabetes. But uh, Dr. Sokolovska does also um, research uh, studying uh, factors um, regarding the transition of prediabetes to type 2 diabetes and metabolic risk factors in healthy individuals. That's why she's here today. She has a special interest in, uh, um, in metabolic dysfunction associated with liver disease. She has uh, already authored many publications and um, has served as a principal investigator and collaborator in national and international research uh, projects. Elizaveta, uh, welcome, and uh, we really look forward to enjoy your lecture. Yeah, hello. I will share my screen. So, yeah, dear, dear colleagues, dear chairman of this uh, session, uh, I, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, today I will uh, talk about very practical thing, but about the uh, clinical aspects of uh, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. Uh, recently, uh, we had a new guideline, which actually was published in September this year. And uh, in my talk, uh, I will reference it many times. Uh, so, uh, previously we called this condition, as Lina already outlined, NAFLD, uh, non-alcoholic associated fatty liver disease. But now uh, a better um, uh, title, uh, more uh, corresponding title to the condition is used. So uh, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease is defined as the presence of excess triglyceride storage in the liver in the presence of at least one cardiometabolic risk factor. So let's recall what kind of metabolic risk factors that can be. 
so actually, uh, they are very similar to the uh, metabolic risk factors associated with the uh, definition of metabolic syndrome. Uh, but here we have also a body mass index increased, so more than 25 uh, and uh, lower cutoff in the Asian uh, population, increased waist circumference, and in Europeans, it is uh, 94 centimeters for men and 80 centimeters for women. Also, pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, uh, treatment of type 2 diabetes, increased plasma triglycerides, triglycerides decle decreased HDL cholesterol, and also hypertension. Uh, uh, we should also understand that muscle D is a subtype of steatotic liver disease, and there are so uh, in steatotic liver disease, we have muscle D, but also alcohol-related liver disease, muscle D with moderate alcohol intake, and also specific steatotic liver disease forms, for example, drug-induced liver disease, uh, and so on. And as endocrinologists, of course, we are aware also about uh, uh, other causes of steatotic liver disease in endocrinology, such as hypothyroidism, PCOS, growth hormone deficiency, and pituitary deficiency. Uh, so the guideline um, uh, suggests us the um, uh, algorithm uh, for uh, diagnosis of the metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease. So actually, the most important thing that we have to do in the uh, individual in whom uh, we have identified increased liver fat uh, is to assess the cardiometabolic criteria I have talked before and also assess alcohol consumption. And it helps us uh, to define so uh, uh, what condition is there because if the alcohol consumption is low, then uh, it is probable that uh, it is uh, the, the diagnosis the diagnosis is then metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease uh, with the major uh, probability. Uh, muscle D is uh, a severe condition uh, uh, because of its progressive nature. Uh, so it, uh, uh, the term muscle D incorporates uh, not only isolated liver steatosis, but also metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis and fibrosis and cirrhosis. And the uh, mesh is characterized by histological features of hepatocellular ballooning and lobular inflammation. Pathogenesis of muscle D is very complex, and definitely I will not, uh, uh, I do not have time today to talk about that. And many factors are uh, contributing here. Uh, importantly, uh, uh, detrimental nutritional factors, uh, such as, for example, high fructose, uh, uh, sugared beverages, and so on, um, increased body fat, uh, but also dysfunctions in the immune system and uh, in gut microbiome. Uh, the prevalence of muscle D is increasing. Uh, so, uh, Currently, uh, more than 30% uh, of global prevalence uh, has been recorded, and uh, we are expecting a rise in the prevalence. Uh, and uh, uh, a worrying uh, thing is that uh, approximately 10 to 30% per 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 of uh, persons with isolated steatosis will progress to steatohepatitis and advanced liver disease. And in type 2 diabetes, this is even more uh, uh, prevalent. So uh, you can see here in this study that um, muscle D in type 2 uh, diabetes here, in particular this study, uh, so 65% of uh, uh, patients with type 2 diabetes had muscle D, and in other studies uh, the number is also reported uh, very high, and uh, the percentage among uh, these muscle D subjects uh, uh, with type 2 diabetes uh, almost a half uh, have mesh. So this is a really uh, worrying situation. 
Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that means that we need to identify and treat subjects with muscle D early, uh, because muscle D is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events, chronic kidney disease, also hepatic and extrahepatic malignancies and liver related outcomes, including liver failure and hepatocellular carcinoma. So it is, of course, a high socioeconomic burden. But the good news is that we have improved treatment options. Therefore, we need to identify uh, individuals uh, uh, with muscle D early. So, okay, uh, whom to screen? Uh, first of all, screening in the general population is not recommended, uh, but we have to screen the population groups uh, with higher probability of progressing to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. That means type 2 diabetes patients, subjects with obesity, particularly abdominal obesity, individuals with multiple cardiometabolic risk factors, and uh, uh, individuals with elevated liver enzymes. And currently lower thresholds for LAT were proposed uh, for males more than 30, uh, 33 units per liter and for females more than 25 units per, per liter. Other groups uh, also uh, at increased risk of muscle D are males aged uh, more than 50 years, postmenopausal women, uh, individuals with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, patients with polycystic ovary syndrome. However, the evidence for these groups uh, are not strong enough yet, but still we have to keep also these groups in mind. So how to screen? Uh, of course, ultrasonography is uh, the easiest option. Uh, and as you can see on the picture, uh, increased, uh, it, it uh, detects uh, quite well uh, increased uh, fat deposits by identifying, identifying hyperechogenicity in the liver in comparison with the renal parenchyma. It is uh, non-invasive, quite fast and relatively inexpensive technique and also uh, demonstrates quite good sensitivity and specificity for detecting moderate uh, to severe levels of steatosis. But Unfortunately, it is operator dependent. Uh, the parameters uh, to categorize degrees of steatosis are not well defined. And also the sensitivity of the technique uh, decreases uh, uh, with increasing body mass index. So actually in subjects with obesity, uh, the sensitivity is quite low. Uh, there are also special ultrasound techniques, uh, for example, vibration control transient elastography. And uh, these techniques not only can um, assess steatosis, but also fibrosis. So, for example, in vibration control transient elastography, if it is if it is equipped with a module called controlled attenuation parameter, it provides a relatively reliable estimation of the degree of steatosis and the liver stiffness uh, measurement is also done. Uh, similar techniques are two-dimensional shear wave elastography and point shear wave elastography. But again, uh, with, uh, in adults with class two obesity and above, uh, the sensitivity and specificity decreases. MRI-based technique can also be used, but of course, uh, I think, uh, of course, um, not in a wide screening because of the price and uh, uh, and also, yeah, the time and, and so on. Uh, but uh, um, uh, MRI estimated proton density fat fraction is a, uh, an approach uh, which actually considered uh, a gold standard for the assessment and quantification of liver steatosis. Percentage of fat uh, identified by these techniques cannot be directly comparable to the percentage of steatosis on histology because on histology uh, there is a quantification of the cells um, and here uh, the uh, uh, liver fat, uh, but uh, it is a, a nice technique and uh, also Magnetic resonance spectroscopy can be used, but it is less available and uh, MRI elastography uh, can also be used, but again, uh, it is available only at a few sites. Uh, so, uh, 
importantly, we have to monitor individuals with muscle D uh, not to miss fibrosis. And uh, the good news, however, is that uh, not only uh, is the progression going from steatosis to steatohepatitis, fibrosis, and cirrhosis, but also we can reverse the condition, especially in the uh, lower stages. Uh, but even in cirrhosis, it is possible to improve a little bit the uh, situation. Um, Okay, so now we have established a person uh, with it increased liver fat, with muscle D. Uh, what next? Uh, of course, it uh, depends on the degree of the disease at the moment, but uh, even if, for example, if there is uh, uh, the initial stage, so um, only liver steatosis, still we have <clears throat> to do the surveillance. And <clears throat> the guidelines recommend uh, to use non-invasive scores, such as, for instance, FIP4 score, uh, for monitoring of such patients. And as you can see on the slide, uh, if the uh, FIP4 uh, is below 1.3, then uh, the risk of fibrosis is uh, low, and we can reassess the person uh, every one to three years. On the other hand, in the borderline range, so FIP4 from 1.3 to uh, 2.67, um, uh, there is uh, already indication of for uh, elastography or alternative test and also intensified management of comorbidities. Uh, and finally, if uh, the FIP4 uh, is uh, above 2.67, uh, then uh, hepatology referral is recommended. It is important to mention that in individuals older than 65 years, uh, we would use a lower threshold uh, to rule out fibrosis, so it would be 2. Uh, what about the scores? So here uh, you can see the examples of three scores. Uh, FIP4 as, uh, is the most widely established and available tool on the slide uh, on the left. And you can see that the uh, input variables are very easy and inexpensive. Uh, so it is age, uh, uh, transaminases, and platelet counts. And online there are a lot of calculators which can help us to uh, get the result and this is this can be easily done uh, during uh, the patient visit. Uh, another score also quite uh, widely used uh, is APRI, uh, also have similar input variables and NAFLD fibrosis score with a bit more compli complicated formula. Um, uh, actually, quite many laboratories, clinical laboratories, have incorporated FIP4 in their output, so they uh, they, they do it uh, uh, for clinicians. So even uh, it's no 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 need to uh, uh, use the calculator. However, we should keep in mind uh, so that in the elderly and in type 2 diabetes, the most risky group, uh, uh, the uh, FIP4 ability to detect fibrosis is limited. And as a single test, it also can result in high number of false positives. So we use it, but uh, uh, we can use it repeatedly and also, also complement with other methods. There are also other scores, uh, also based on laboratory measures, um, uh, on the components of collagen formation. So when there is uh, damage to the liver, then of course, uh, uh, Kupfer cells and macrophages get activated, and this uh, can uh, and this results in uh, increased collagen break breakdown, uh, and these uh, 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 these. Uh, uh, molecules can be measured, not molecules, but parts <laughs> of the collagen. So, and uh, uh, two tests are more widely used, uh, uh, ALF, uh, which uh, contains uh, uh, hyaluronic acid, amino terminal propeptide of uh, type 3 procollagen and also tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases 1. And actually, again, uh, quite many clinical labs have already it in their uh, in their uh, uh, price lists, but uh, of course, uh, these tests are quite uh, expensive. Um, 
what about fasarium ferritin, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, often elevated uh, in subjects with muscle D? Um, uh, actually, it, it is not included in the in the recent guideline, but um, there are uh, data that uh, uh, use of ferritin. Uh, can increase the sensitivity of FIP4. And for example, in, uh, yeah, in this study, you can see that uh, um, the thresholds uh, of 215 and uh, 272 uh, were associated uh, with the um, risk of uh, liver-related events uh, and also mortality. Uh, so uh, the authors of this particular study suggest uh, uh, that uh, uh, ferritin still has to be included in uh, uh, FIP4 uh, or uh, an overall um, in uh, in another score. Uh, so uh, another score containing also uh, ferritin maybe could be helpful to improve the risk prediction. Uh, and of course, biopsy, but biopsy in majority of cases is not required for clinical management of individuals with muscle D still to establish the diagnosis of um, steatohepatitis, uh, uh, biopsy is uh, necessary. So, uh, okay, uh, so uh, we understood that muscle D is so important, and now we have already established muscle D. Uh, but uh, so what, what should we do? Uh, we, ho of course, have to treat muscle D to improve the outcomes. And uh, as I already said, uh, the good news is that uh, each stage of the muscle D uh, is reversible. Uh, for example, in advanced uh, fibrosis or cirrhosis, regression of fibrosis has been associated with reduced uh, liver-related outcomes. Also, improvement in activity of steatohepatitis has been associated with regression of fibrosis, and reduction of steatosis has been associated with histological improvements in some pharmacological interventional studies. So, uh, we have a good uh, motivation. How to treat? Uh, the cornerstone uh, on the left part of this slide, you can see the um, uh, weight loss. So the slide uh, shows you part uh, a picture from the guideline and uh, uh, still uh, weight loss is uh, uh, the first thing to consider. Uh, but also diet, physical activity, other lifestyle habits, uh, and uh, uh, also medications if indicated. Uh, so what can we achieve with weight loss and in whom? Uh, first of all, in adults with uh, muscle D and overweight, uh, if uh, the weight loss is more than 5%, it would reduce the liver fat. 7 to 10% can improve liver inflammation and more than 10% can improve fibrosis. But also for adults with muscle D and normal weight, uh, some weight loss is recommended, uh, 3 to 5%. Uh, it's important to not note that in adults uh, with uh, MASH-related liver cirrhosis, diet and weight loss should be adapted to the severity of the disease, especially if sarcopenia is present. And here is a one uh, example from one study um, uh, where they used <clears throat> Uh, di uh, where they used uh, three groups. There were uh, dietary uh, guidelines or uh, uh, calorie restriction. Uh, so here are the standard recommendation and uh, uh, calorie restrictive diets. And uh, the blue one uh, is only a little bit supplemented uh, with uh, walnuts as a source of polyphenol. And uh, the green med diet was very rich in polyphenol. So you can see that, yeah, simple recommendations caused uh, small uh, re weight reduction, big re uh, calorie restriction caused better uh, result, and uh, weight loss is associated also with reduction of liver fat. Uh, of course, uh, if we talk about weight loss, then it is not just uh, uh, 
possibility is not just lifestyle, but also bariatric surgery. And uh, there are plenty of studies about bariatric surgery, uh, and it is, of course, effective in muscle D uh, because it is associated with weight loss. And uh, this study uh, seemed very interesting to me because it is a retrospective study, but with 1,158 uh, patients. And um, uh, so here uh, uh, they did a, a liver biopsy and uh, the bariatric surgery group, so bariatric surgery was done in the bariatric surgery group. So there was no randomization. That was a retrospective study. And we can see that in the bariatric surgery group, major adverse liver outcomes are much lower, statistically significantly lower than in non-surgical group. Uh, and uh, as I already said, it's not the only study. Um, so the bariatric surgery, of course, uh, is... Um, an option uh, for uh, muscle D subjects uh, with overweight, if indicated, of course. Not overweight, but obesity, and according to the indication. What about alcohols? Actually, better no alcohol. Um, uh, there are some studies uh, um, uh, discussing that moderate alcohol consumption might be beneficial in uh, low-grade steatosis, but uh, uh, still uh, the general uh, conclusion is uh, the lower the better. And to quantify, we can use uh, the uh, high-risk alcohol consumption guidelines. And for women, it's uh, uh, more than two standard drinks per day or 10 standard drinks per week. And for, for men, a little bit more. But uh, it is the high-risk alcohol consumption for moderate lower thresholds. So uh, not to forget to remind patients about alcohol. What about diet? Actually, for diet, also plenty of approaches, uh, but the guidelines chose uh, to recommend uh, just uh, the Mediterranean diet as uh, uh, it is uh, the majority of evidence is about Mediterranean diet. But as you know, now the approaches are uh, developing uh, uh, time restricted feeding and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that nuts are good for your liver. So here you can see a meta-analysis of several studies and nut consumption was uh, inversely associated with uh, muscle D. So uh, don't forget uh, um, and remind your patients about this healthy snack. Another thing is coffee. So I think all the doctors now are very happy because we drink a lot of coffee. And here uh, is a meta-analysis about coffee consumption. And uh, actually, uh, quite a lot of coffee has to be consumed. So more than three cups a day was considered as an exposure in this meta-analysis. And you can see that uh, not only the risk of muscle D decrease, but also the risk of fibrosis development in subjects with existing muscle T. Uh, so uh, what about supplements? Patients ask us a lot about the supplements, but uh, here um, not uh, so much of uh, conclusive data. Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid studies still ongoing. Ursa deoloxyholic acid, very promising compound, shows uh, effects on uh, transaminase uh, reduction, uh, but uh, uh, no big uh, uh, proof on uh, the uh, change of mesh activity in RTCs. Uh, vitamin E is also actually quite promising and quite studied, but still uh, no large three, uh, phase three trial has been performed, uh, therefore uh, not a strong recommendation. Physical activity, again, uh, hundreds, tens uh, of, uh, of uh, hundreds of uh, studies, uh, biggest studies, smaller studies, um, and uh, uh, 
But actually, the uh, recommendation, the same as in other metabolic diseases, 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 of vigorous intensity exercise a week, uh, and uh, uh, irrespective of the exercise type, both resistance and aerobic training or um, uh, high intensity interval training, uh, everything is possible. And as an option, there is an interesting study uh, from Finland about the hula hoop but it is not uh, about um, so they um used weighted hula hooping and patients uh, um, used it for 13 minutes a day uh, for six weeks which reduced abdominal fat unfortunately liver fat was not uh, studied there um, but probably if it reduced abdominal fat maybe also good for the liver then that's also maybe a good idea uh, okay, so do we have any NASH targeted uh, therapies? Yes. Um, also a novelty, uh, uh, liver directed thyroid hormone receptor agonists are now on the market. So for us, uh, for many of the audience endocrinologists, it's nice news because we like the thyroid glands and uh, uh, so the um, uh, of course, receptors for thyroid hormones are in many organs and also uh, the uh, thyroid hormone receptor beta subtype uh, is in the liver and its activation is positive um, for uh, reduction of steatosis and inflammation uh, and therefore a drug uh, resmetirone has been approved uh, for um, non-serotic mesh. Of course, the drug is not yet available in uh, all countries, but already uh, entering uh, the treatment. Uh, so, um, as, uh, as we discussed already, many of patients with NAFLD are type 2 diabetes patients. And of course, a question uh, arises, which drugs uh, can we use in treatment of hyperglycemia? Uh, here, uh, I, uh, I should say that restrictions apply mainly for advanced liver dysfunction, which is cirrhosis uh, class uh, uh, C, child pu class C. Uh, this is the child pu classification to remind you. But, uh, of course, class C uh, is uh, already uh, a severe stage. Uh, and uh, for drugs, uh, the majority of classes, so all of them are safe in child pu A class. In child pu B class, uh, maybe some dose reductions are needed, but I should say that it is a matter of debate and uh, uh, data are quite unconclusive. Uh, but in child uh, PUC class, uh, of course, uh, we have several, uh, the majority of groups are not recommended except insulin uh, and DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, but also we would use with caution, of course, because of the risk of hypoglycemia, a risk uh, is increased because of the reduced glyconeogenesis in the lip. Um, GLP receptor agonists and other incretin agonists, uh, of course, have major, uh, m m a lot of uh, pathogenic pathways uh, to address uh, muscle D. And therefore, um, as, uh, quite uh, many uh, uh, trials are ongoing. Uh, considering effects of uh, uh, incretin uh, analogs in muscle D, uh, but, but yet uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no improvement in MASH in phase three trials has been demonstrated. Uh, however, the compounds, several compounds were effective uh, to uh, decrease the liver fat, uh, but mainly again in phase two trials. Uh, so we are still awaiting uh, the results, and so these are uh, the compounds uh, under investigation uh, for MESH. Yeah, so terzepatite, uh, uh, semaglutide, terzepatite, uh, dual and triple uh, incretin agonists. Uh, 
Bioglitazone uh, has uh, been quite longly uh, uh, considered as a very promising uh, uh, drug uh, in the aspect of um, uh, liver fat reduction, but unfortunately due to side effect profile, it was withdrawn from uh, many European country market and therefore also the investigation, the trials uh, stopped and so we have no large phase three trial therefore uh, no conclusive results metformin uh, also uh, all drug and no one wants to uh, to do uh, big trials with the drug which is uh, very strongly in the in the treatment scheme um, but uh, uh, therefore only small effects uh, and small studies have been done uh, considering muscle d and metformin uh, but uh, what is important that here in this study you can see that uh, actually uh, continuation of metformin even in cirrhosis improves the outcome, improves survival. So the recommendation is not to stop um, uh, metformin unless they compensate cirrhosis. Statins. Uh, uh, I don't know how it's in, uh, in other countries, but in Latvia specifically statins raise the question uh, about liver safety in patients. Uh, but I should say that statins are safe in chronic liver disease also, which arose due to muscle D, including compensated cirrhosis. Then of course, we have to use it to, redu to reduce these drugs, to reduce uh, the cardiovascular risk of the patients, which is hugely increased because of, of the muscle D itself. So, uh, to conclude, uh, muscle D is a prevalent condition posing significant health risks. Individuals with type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cardiometabolic risk factors should be screened for muscle D. Non-invasive radiological methods and scores based on laboratory markers are recommended for surveillance. Weight loss is the cornerstone of the management, either by lifestyle interventions or bariatric surgery. Uh, physical activity and dietary recommendations are similar to those in, in other cardiometabolic diseases. And now we have the targeted therapy for MESH, liver-directed thyroid hormone receptor agonists. Uh, type 2 diabetes therapies are safe in muscle D up to cirrhosis child uh, class C, and ingratin agonists demonstrate positive effects in muscle D, but are still to be used for their indications, so type 2 diabetes and obesity, as trials in muscle D are ongoing. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Zelizaveta, uh, uh, for this very comprehensive uh, overview of uh, this uh, very uh, prevalent clinical condition. I think that uh, you gave us all the spectrum uh, that a clinical uh, medical endocrinologist uh, needs uh, to know. Uh, I agree with you that um, uh, the new treatments are very interesting, and especially for endocrinologists, it's nice to see that uh, hormones uh, uh, can play an important role in uh, the therapeutic approach of uh, such patients.